We're talking about a young man, a young married man who did something stupid, got much drunker than he should, and got himself in a bad situation. That's it. Hey, hey, hello, leavers, believers, and everybody else. Welcome back to Leaving Hillsong. My name's Tanya, and this episode is called The Power to Say No. Because there is just such an influx of heavy, heavy information like our episode last week, I, uh, I kind of wanted this to be a, a lighter episode, but starting to wonder if we should maybe call this show uh, Trigger Warning because tell you what, we're going to do a news update and then um, it's going to get real. Now, to start with our court list report today, I'd just like us all to take a moment celebrate Queen Natalie Moses. As you know, there's been a employment suit filed uh, by Natalie Moses, a former employee of Hillsong who has bravely stepped forward and blown about 50 different whistles about how Hillsong is run from a financial point of view. And I just think it's going to be a very interesting ride and I've been working all week trying to get some people together to give you some expert opinions on what's going on here and what this all means. Yeah, things have happened so fast that it's been delayed a little bit but uh, thank you Queen Natalie and we'll be attending to that case really soon. I have legals who've been following it really closely and I'm also excited to tell you that Barry Bowen is going to join us from the US again. Barry is an investigator who works for Trinity, who look at televangelists all around the world and their corruption. And he's going to tell us what he thinks of this case from that side of the world. And yes, I know the sound quality here leaves a lot to be desired. I'm working on it. All right. There's, uh, you know, there's just so many court cases and um, yeah so many stories. If you're looking for something to do, do make sure you head on over to the Hillsong Accountability Instagram and Facebook account. The account was recently the subject of a threatened lawsuit by one former pastor, Pat Masiti. Among Mr. Masiti's concerns are that the account imputed that he resembled an animated emu. The paperwork will be made available on the Leaving Hillsong Facebook page. And this week the trial of Pastor John McMartin began. It was a four-day hearing and the charge was of indecent assault against an 18-year-old woman. These charges were laid early last year but there has been an incredible backlog in our courts in our state. And so he only went to trial this week. There was no jury. It is a judge only hearing. And I'll bring you a summary of what took place. So I'm told that the final hearing is scheduled for October of this year. The verdict date will be set for the 24th of November, 2022. There wasn't enough time for closing statements. There are multiple charges. There are inconsistencies in McMartin's testimony versus his original statements. And Pastor John McMartin stated that he had consumed 19 standard drinks on the day of the alleged assault. So there's another one for the legacy of alcohol in the AOG. It's beginning to sound a lot like the football leagues in Australia 
John McMartin testified at the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses into Child Sexual Abuse because he was one of the first people that received the information that Frank Houston, the original founder of Hillsong, was a pedophile. And uh, I'll leave it alone, it's all in the transcripts, what McMartin did with that information, which was very close to nothing, according to his testimony. So if I'm sounding a little sick to my stomach, it's because I am. And I thought what we'd do is lighten the mood because Brian won this award for just being a misogynist pig. And this um, friend of mine, Meg, messaged me and I thought, what a way to go. We'll kind of lighten it a little. Um, and I guess this is where those of you who have had enough of the news update uh, might want to change channels or leave the room because we're going to talk about child sexual assault in a really real and um, meaningful way. Meg is going to share some experiences from her own life. So um, I'm really, really, really sick of having to tell people that there's going to be talk of sexual abuse on leaving Hillsong and... Uh, I'm just really sick of it. So this is there's two parts here and uh, part two will be out as soon as possible. I'll put the pics up and some video on the Facebook page. But, you know, we talk about these people as abstractly, these predators, these perpetrators. I just, I'm so sick of it. Here's an incredibly brave and just insightful, wonderful, infinite friend of mine called Megs. And uh, she went to an award show called The Ernie. She nominated Brian for an award for misogyny. And uh, the results were wonderful. If such a thing can be wonderful, they're accurate. Here's the power to say no. So something very exciting happened this week. Brian Houston, who um, used to run Hillsong, he won an award in Australia. and. It's just been a moment of national pride and I'm lucky enough to have somebody who was there who nominated him and because he wasn't able to make the night. So so my guest today was able to collect that award on his behalf. I, I'm so thrilled to introduce you to Meg. She's, um, she's in Melbourne and Meg, what is what are these awards, these Ernie Awards? Please just tell me everything. Hi, Tanya. It's a huge privilege to be on your podcast. Hello, I'm hello. a huge fan of you. Stop it. When I moved to moved back to Australia in well, twelve years ago, I'd been living in the States for a decade with my wonderful American husband Benjamin. My sister Saren gave me a book by Tanya Levine called People in Glass Houses, which I eagerly read and was very inspired by. Because as someone who's grown up in the Anglican church, as a minister's kid, having to kind of smile and be very nicely dressed to impress the congregation. And in honesty, I, I felt for me growing up that the congregation were always more important than me and my own mental health and my own needs and so on. So I've got a really confusing relationship with church. I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. So the Ernie's was started by my wonderful godmother, Meredith Bergman, who has been a feminist role model and encouragement of me my entire life and for whom wow. I'm so deeply thankful. Wow. And she's a she's a member of parliament here in Australia, yeah? Is she, she, not, is she still in parliament? No, but she's still very much a voice yes. for the vulnerable. She's very left-wing, Labor politician, and she's been a voice for the vulnerable in millions of different situations she's an advocate for first nations people here in australia who are still absolutely terribly treated like despite lots of lip service being paid there's still yeah. awful racism awful injustice that yep. and i work with homeless yep. youth here in melbourne and i see that day to day in my work and in my life my cats are coming in if you hear a little mew that's ptolemy and freya joining in the conversation the cats are always welcome the cats are always welcome but Thank why, you. Ernie, what was, so sorry, so what was, who's Ernie in this? Like, why'd they call it? So Ernie, Ernie E. Cobb was an Australian Workers' Union secretary known for misogynistic remarks. For example, women aren't welcome in the shearing sheds. Oh, They're only after the sex, which is why there's a sheep on top of the gold Ernie. 
So the very first okay. Ernie's were just to get together of a bunch of people celebrating his resignation. Thursday night was the 30th and last of the Ernie's. I feel very thankful to have gone quite a few times. To The thing that's amazing about the Ernie's is that it's a whole bunch of women, a room full of 350 women. And so suddenly I become aware of the patriarchy that's always there in the air. Mm. Suddenly, if someone bumps into you, you don't have to feel as if you're invisible and not noticed. The person will apologize and care about you. And so I nominated Brian Houston for the clerical Ernie. Why? But like, why? Why? What were you doing? I mean, you work full time. You've got kids. What? What were you doing when you thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to nominate Brian Houston for the clerical. Now the clerical Ernie is called a Fred, right? Is that after Fred Nile? I don't actually know, but it could well be. Because there's um, an Elaine as well. And Fred Nile was like a Jerry Falwell kind of, you know, well, still is a very, very conservative Christian influence in our parliament. And I, I wonder if the Fred is named after him. This has all happened kind of quickly. So we don't have... So, I, so the, the Ernie that, that Brian won, I had in my possession for the rest of the night. And I actually... I, I actually accidentally broke a plate because I was banging it and booing so loudly and enthusiastically. <laughs> but I had to turn it in. I think usually you keep it for the year and bring it back next year, but I had to turn it in at the end of the night. But I took a lot of pictures of it. So Tanya, I'll, I'll send them to you. So you'll be able to see on those pictures who the first offender was and whether it indeed actually was Fred Nile. So, yeah, back to kind of like what inspired you what inspired you to, to nominate Brian? And I wonder how much competition there was because the competition in Australia for sexism in men and misogyny, I mean, it's it's tough. There's a lot. Absolutely. Australia is a very sexist, misogynistic Disgusting country. Problem. So there's a number of different things. And I like to go back to the roots of things. So I myself grew up in a Christian home Anglican minister's daughter and from the age of seven till the age of 14 I was sexually abused by my grandfather and lived in this weird fake space thank you thank you a weird fake space where I had to be all happy and delightful and charming and responsive and glorifying God and glorifying my family and yet inside me I had undiagnosed complex post-traumatic stress disorder and that's a mental health condition, which means that every single day, for some of the day or some of the moments, I'm feeling terrified because I'm being triggered and, and feel extremely unsafe. I think safety wasn't something I ever felt until I started going to therapy and having healing. I go to a little church called Cafe Church at Northcote Uniting Church, High Street, with a bunch of people who are just so utterly respectful of other human beings. Thank you so and much for speaking those things. I, so many people listening that go through their day like that and feel bad about themselves. So I just really want to thank you for saying those things. Well, my beloved friend, Mark Fallows, he's a really dear friend of mine and he also grew up in a similar environment and he always talks about self-love and self-kindness and it's a really, really simple message and it's so profound because yeah. I think it was yeah. the exact opposite. I think I grew up invisible to myself. I think as a child and as a teenager, me and my body and my needs didn't matter. And I did, interestingly. So when I was 14, I kind of thought it all through in conversation with my cousin, Judy. And I've just spent, uh, while I was at the Ernie's, I, my cousin, April, and my daughter, Ewan, came along, which was fantastic. And they're both wonderful human beings. So I've been thinking about family and so on. But my, in conversation with my cousin Judy, I came to a place of wanting Jesus to be someone I related to. And again, I don't want to be offensive to anyone in saying that because I really respect whatever belief system or way of seeing the world any person ends up having. But for me, that's the one that I've chosen or that's the way or the person that I've chosen. And so that is a huge complexity because... I see all the time, not just in the past, but in the present, the church being a place where predators, pedophiles, harmful people get glorified and they're harming people and no one gives a flying fuck. And that's the twofold kind of part. It's like there's this real, you know, garden of 
just so much opportunity for predators and exactly. there there just doesn't seem to be the protection or the aftercare I, it, it oh, a beautiful and who says that the church is a sitting duck for predators Anna Salter. So there's a an amazing thinker and writer named Anna Salter who wrote a book called Predators, which is amazing reading. Yeah. Like difficult reading, but amazing reading. And in it, Anna Salter interviewed lots and lots of sexual predators. And they love the church because it's a place where you can go along, spend her whole career working with incarcerated predators. So she really was researching. And that's what they told her, that they loved churches. These predators in prison said, we love churches because you could go along and you could sexually abuse children and adults and anyone you wanted to sexually abuse. No one would do anything. They'd talk about forgiveness. They'd let you stay amongst the children and the young women and keep abusing them. And I really, truly think with sexual abuse, and, and this is from my own story, if the response to me being sexually abused was for my family to say granddad he's a person who abused me you're not welcome in this family anymore leave and to give me the therapeutic support I needed to heal I think I would have been fine I don't think I would have had complex post-traumatic stress disorder but I didn't even feel safe enough to say what had happened kids know yeah. kids know where they're safe and and where they're exactly not. we were talking about this last week and um uh, with a a researcher and a, a writer called Nick Jordan who works on um, who works with redress for victims of institutional abuse and how important it is that we were looking how noteworthy it is that the Royal Commission was institutional responses to child sexual abuse so you know they they know it's going on and what the hell are people doing about it still it seems to be, and you've kept your faith because I, I mean, my observations over time have been that it's the church's poor response that ultimately leads to people leaving their faith, even more so than perhaps the abuse. Absolutely. And I think for me, I'm really not a fan of most churches, but I am, a, and I, I mean, I, I sound like a teenager in youth group, but I am a fan of Jesus. Like I, I think that through some really difficult experiences of my life, I mean, for example, when it comes to the sexual abuse, I was living on a ship called Logos 2 and processing all this stuff intensely for the first time in my life. And I said, Jesus, where were you? Where were you when I was being sexually abused by granddad? And I had this incredible experience of, it was as if I was in the dark, absolute darkness. And during the experience of abuse, Jesus was holding my heart and it was as if my heart were being absolutely lacerated, whipped, destroyed. And Jesus was holding my heart and, and crying and, and grieving because he knew much more than me how much pain that was causing me and how much damage that was causing. And it was devastating to him. And I, I was crying and had a sense of Jesus crying with me. And I must say that I really relate to Jesus on the cross experiencing awful pain awful abuse awful yuckiness all the yucky things and I I think that Jesus on the cross is able to hold anything and everything because there's really awful things that happen I work with homeless young people here in Melbourne and the stories I hear and the lack of power and the lack of anyone taking someone's story seriously is so horrifying it's I mean sometimes when I get home from work I sit out the front in the car with music playing loudly just screaming because I'm so angry about things that are happening in real time, not just yeah. in the past, and how much injustice there is and how much or how little anybody cares. And it seems to me, and it's interesting, I think another reason I'm able to stay a Christian is that I've had a lot of healing from Christians. So on the ship, Alan and Miles counseled me. And then in America, I lived in Seattle, Washington for nine years and my children were born there. And mm -hmm. the reason for that is that my wonderful husband benjamin is an american i mean sorry if this is too much where was jesus like this is a big question because there are so many sexual abuse survivors of christian churches asking that same question i wouldn't do this to you if you hadn't brought it up where did 
where where was God when you were a little girl? And you totally don't have to answer that. I think right there with, I don't want to be assuming no anything about anyone else's story in terms of me speaking into your story and saying what happened or didn't happen. But I know for me and my story that Jesus was with me in, in the most awful moments and that the only way a faith of any kind can make any sense is if it's something that covers the most awful moments, including death, including hideous death, including being buried alive, all of that stuff, all of those things are there. And no belief system that, that doesn't somehow account for all that means anything to me. I'm a very sensitive person and so and and probably this was partly to do with being abused and not feeling safe but as a child I would lie in bed screaming terrified of the idea of eternity and terrified of death and terrified of being buried alive and all of these things and things don't make sense if there's not a holding of that stuff because that affects all of us we're mortal beings yeah. and I think as a child and ad as an adolescent and as an adult, in those moments, I have a sense, and it's not necessarily tangible, but I have a sense of Jesus being in all of that with me and that it's not things I have to face alone. Okay. So I think that Jesus has managed to sneak in below my defences and be there with me where many, many human beings haven't managed to. And certainly my sense is that the church can can be so harmful because people come to the to the church wanting to find some help and healing and then they're not believed and with this nomination for the oh, yeah for the so, clerical right, so, okay okay so sorry yes so well i mean sorry so, just to interrupt you can i just interrupt you briefly that was magnificent um i hope that didn't hurt you um that was magnificent thank you sorry i interrupted you jump into the nomination sorry sorry okay Regarding his staff member, Jason May's sexually assaulting 18-year-old Anna Crenshaw at a social function, on stage, Brian Houston said, and this was in The Australian this year, I'm just reading from The Australian, we're not talking about a sexual predator here. We're talking about a young man, a young married man who did something stupid, got much drunker than he should, which is an issue we've got to keep addressing and got himself in a bad situation. That's it. So that message absolutely appalled me. Okay. Anna Crenshaw experienced this hideous sexual abuse, sexual assault, horrible, horrible thing. It feels to me as if women's bodies somehow or other don't matter in the patriarchy. It's like people can do whatever they want to our vaginas, oh, yeah. our uteruses, our breasts, our legs, our bottoms, and these things don't matter. In they, they actually really don't matter to people. So in this quote, Something awful happened to Anna that she with every day, the, the ramifications of having experienced that. And then Brian, who's someone people look up to, people listen to and people honour, the understory in what he's saying is the person who matters in this story that we have to care for and respond to is a, a man who got too drunk. We need to work on him not getting so drunk. We need to help him. Yeah. As if Anna, as the woman in the story who had been the victim of an awful crime and awful abuse didn't matter and her Doesn't. voice and her experience and her yes. body were just there as a backdrop for a man who was too yep. drunk and this story yep. in the church in in the world is the normal story people aren't going to care about women's bodies and as all the women listening know unless you're living in some amazing non-patriarchal society which I don't know exists <laughs> all experienced a man walking along and bumping into us and not even noticing now the devaluing of other human beings on the basis of color and race and gender and sexuality too my friends who are trans and, and gay yeah. and lesbian experience but, awful awful negativity and that's not what Jesus is like yeah. but I think just shut up with your silly bible verses about those things Let's just let's just focus on love. And I know people would say I'm a silly, soppy liberal, and they can say that if they like. But I just don't think something makes sense if you're not going to include and love everybody. I love hearing different people's interpretation because we were raised fundamentalist that there is one way, Jesus, one way. And yeah, there might be uh, at risk of being a postmodernist from the '90s. There have to be infinite interpretations of this thing then surely so that's why there's no offend this person or that person the, the 
evangelicals have never apologized for offending anybody before they push their truth. So, you know, it's just so interesting to hear the wide variety and the rainbow of people's experiences. Beautiful. If nothing else, do no harm. So, you know, it sounds like that's, yes, your, that's your mission. It is interesting to also hear how the, the Hillsong and the Assemblies of God people influence other people. They're not just this little group on their own. The things they say and do impact people. And I'll grab that speech if I can because his tone of voice when he was defending um, Jason Mays, who is the son of a, of a colleague, Jason Mays' father, John, has worked at Hillsong for 30 years or something. And he recently actually wrote a letter, you know, just speaking out against some of Brian's actions. But, yeah, uh, he was very defensive. It's 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 a sinister kind of feeling when you hear that kind of defence. Absolutely. Because it's it's making a woman who's been seriously, seriously harmed invisible and not matter. And that's the message that yeah. we hear so often. And it's, it's like there's a double message because there's lots of very superficial things saying, you know, like if, if a rapist, especially a child predator is mentioned, everyone will say how evil they are. And yet we're all in systems which is allowing, systems which are allowing people, hang on, I'm, I need to formulate this thought. I think that, well, okay, I'll speak personally. So for me, I find it very, very difficult when people are saying, oh, that, that awful person is a child rapist, what, how, how dreadful that is, when I know for myself and for so many others including people I'm working with in the here and the now in real time, are experiencing their rape, their molestation, their abuse as something that matters so little to the people in their lives, the adults in their lives who could protect yeah. them, yeah. that nothing is done yeah. and that they're continuing fed to the lines. I mean, for me, I was sent to my granddad again and again and again, oh. even after it was found out that he was sexually, oh that he had sexually abused me. And it, after I, like when I was 14, I started saying no. And of course, I then believed for years and years that all of those times when I was younger than 14 that he'd abused me must be my fault because I found the power to say no. In Seattle area, I go into schools and prisons giving a talk about abuse and addiction and sexual health and sexual healing and all of these things. And I, you know, I keep thinking time and time again, these. These are the places, these are the these are the destinations, the prisons and the rehabs and stuff, you know. So a a child might not matter now. Everybody thinks it was or sorry, people might say, Oh, it was just this or it was just that or you were just a kid or it can't and you know, they're not there at the rehabs and the prisons and the yeah, it it's it's the most yeah. phenomenal yeah incredible impact that it has on the human beings it's on the human psyche it's just incredible it's an urgent urgent crisis and uh absolutely, absolutely. speaking about it today like I'm just so thrilled with your courage today because yeah there's just so many people that just even just speaking it out loud yeah is, is just incredible thank you um so so very you, welcome so all right so then it's statements like Houston made about you know this young married man that that can really impact you and make you just kind of really remember the power that they're holding and that they're reminding you that they have yeah yes very much so and I think for me because for so many years I lived in a space where women being raped didn't matter my perspective is such that I can really easily be in a situation and an interaction and just feel so awful and feel so small and not be realizing what's happening until I talk it over with my therapist afterwards but it means that okay. feeling feelings of terror can be quite common in my day and and you know getting older you kind of realize that Life's just going to be like that, isn't it? And it's not, you know, the day's going to be good and it's going to be hard and it's going to be tough and it's going to might be cold and, you know, um, 
that's not a failure. That doesn't mean you're a flawed human yeah. being. It's all life. Exactly. And, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I think one thing I found really helpful is becoming more aware of my body and the value of my body. And I've, so my sister Saren took me to a yoga class for the first time when I lived in the States. And I now do yoga every day. And it's been a beautiful way of being in my body and being aware of my body and valuing my body because that doesn't happen naturally for me. I think my body's been so devalued that my natural thought is, oh, I feel hungry, I feel uncomfortable. But that doesn't matter. I need to just defer to whatever else is happening around me still. And I have to quite intentionally think, no, I'm going to care for my body. I love my body. I'm going to listen to my body and help me make it so that every day at 1.30 a little message comes up saying to scan my body and just see how I'm feeling in my body and what's happening and and to calm myself because my pain, my physical pain is very much affected by my mental health and my sort of not treating my body as valuable, if that makes sense. Okay. How long do you spend? Because, I mean, you're working, so one thirty. how long does that take? Just a moment like okay. just oh yeah I have a body gosh okay. um, <laughs> I have a body. Fantastic, because as we know you know fundamentalist churches disregard so you you know totally told to disregard some physical cries when you're in a fundamentalist church if you're tired too bad keep working you know uh all that kind of yes, stuff yes. So, um yes. it's so much body control so that's, that's incredibly liberating. I like that. It's cool.